Our text this morning is short and succinct, one that you will know so well. It simply reads Exodus chapter 20 and verse 13. This is the sixth commandment. You shall not murder. Now, it's not the text that every preacher kind of goes to and preach is from out of preference, as it were. But because we're doing a series on the Ten Commandments, it's only right and proper and vital that we look into this succinct and needy text. And as we think of the text, which you can read on the screen, no doubt all this morning here will have no problem in agreeing with the prohibition of this command, right? An actual fact, of all the commandments... This one will probably stand out as the most important for any community to adhere to and obey. The reason being is that, generally speaking, most people see the value in another person's life to some degree or other. Although in sections of even our community, we see many people who have no value on life at all. It's one of those things that seems to be pervading our culture. But most people will transgress other commandments and willingly do so, but they really put the brakes on when it comes to this one. And I'm glad about that because I might not be here and you might not be here. And, um, and so that's how it is. But strange enough, though this command is direct and succinct, it is frequently misunderstood, believe it or not, and misapplied in so many ways. And of course this begs the question, what does this negative prohibition cover? And what is, as we've been looking at these commandments, what is this commandment positively implying? Because it does both. But before I get into that, what I want you to do is is to look at the foundation of this commandment from God's perspective, because that's how we want to look at the Word of God. That's how we want to have a look at these commandments, from God's perspective. And I think Dan actually covered this. I heard his, looked at his YouTube clip of a few Sunday nights ago on a community spirit, but we're going to be looking at it again. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 to 28, and we can see the foundation of this commandment. Now, we may know this passage very well, but it's worth our time to consider it in relation to this Simple, succinct, but relevant commandment. And the text goes like this. Genesis 1, 26 to 28. Then God said, let us make man in our own image, or in our image, according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female. He created them. Then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Now, just prior to these verses, the Scriptures records for us that God had made the heavens and made the earth and and every living creature that was in them, and and he declared how his work was good, and he he, uh, blesses everything that he has made. But as we know, all was not yet finished. There was one unique action of God's creatorial work that was to be the crowning act of all his creation. That was happened on the sixth day when God made man. And so the Bible tells us of the uniqueness of mankind above all other created things because no other living creature or living thing, whether it be a tree or whether it be an animal, was ever given the honor and the dignity that God has given man. Human beings are unique. And so if you really want to feel good about yourself this morning, not that I promoting too much of that self-esteem stuff, but if you really want to feel good or better about yourself in the eyes of God, understand this, that you are unique because God has created you in his own image. Being made in the image of God is a profound and a mysterious truth. 
that although Dan gave an excellent exposition of what it does mean in so many ways, it's impossible to fully comprehend. But one undeniable aspect of our makeup is that we have been made, created as eternal beings. You got that? Eternal beings. God has stamped eternity in our hearts, folks. The animal kingdom is not so. So there was no doggy heaven, so to speak. Sorry for those who are animal lovers. When your dog or your pet or your fish or whatever dies, that's it, period. But not so with God's created human beings. Above all that God created, he has only created one creature that bears his image, and that is mankind. He made us in his likeness. This in simple term means man is like God. In other words, we represent God on his earth. Mankind is God's vice regents created for his glory. In other words, God said... Okay, this is what I have done. Now it's your turn. I want you to take over and represent me on earth. But as we know, sin entered the world through Adam. And that sin marred. Note I use the word marred. I choose that wisely. It didn't destroy it completely. It didn't annihilate it. It marred the image of God in us, and the consequence of sin is that it brings death and eternal consequences. There is still no creature on earth other than human beings that have been destined. Listen to this. There's no other creature on earth that has been destined to share in the glory that the Father has with the Son. And that's God's people, folks. That's humankind. No other created being is so eternally and unconditionally loved by God as those of humanity that he's bestowed his grace upon and his love upon. There's no other created being is ever given the privilege of being with the Son in such a way as to forever behold the glory of God as his redeemed people. No other created being is invited to ever share in the deep intimacy with the Godhead as to be one with Christ and the Father and to be made perfect as human beings have. No other created being shares such an intimate relationship with our creator, God, folks. No one, no, nothing. Nothing. In other words, this honor and dignity bestowed on us is, is really, it's like nothing else. Not even the angels in heaven have been given such honor and dignity. All these aspects add up to being made in the image of God. What a marvelous work humankind is, right? What a marvelous work. And God values every single one of his creatures deeply. that he has so marvelously made. All this means, of course, as we extrapolate this idea a little bit further, all this means that there is not one single human being on the face of the earth, think about this, that has ever been born, that has ever, that has ever known life, no matter what color, race, or ethnicity, no matter how sophisticated they are or debauched they are, no matter how rich they are or how poor they are, no matter what color skin they have, no other... No human being, no matter what, does not naturally possess the immeasurable value of being made in the image of God. Every single one of us possess that immeasurable value of being made in the image of God. We are linked, can we say. Why? How? For we all bear God's image. We all have this mutual pedigree, can we say? What a marvel man was at his creation. But what a tragedy man became through the fall. There he was 
When God said and looked upon all his creation and there he had made man and he said, very good. There he was, clothed with honor and dignity, yet by sin was ruined. And it was after that sin entered the world through Adam and Eve that this marred image of God began its woeful journey. And that woeful journey soon began to tell its tale in the first recorded sin after the fall. And that first recorded sin after the fall was murder. When one made in the image of God, filled with hate, rose up and struck down the image of God in another. The Bible tells us in Genesis 4.8, Now Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and killed him. The seriousness of this sin and the value that God places on his image bearers, it's further highlighted when, when God speaks to Noah and the remnant of, of humanity after the flood. You know the story of Noah and the flood. And the very institu first institution of human government we have right here. This is what God says to Noah as they come out of the ark kind of thing. Surely for your lifeblood I will demand a reckoning from the hand of every beast I will require it. And from the hand of man, from the hand of every man's brother, I will require the life of man. Whosoever sheds man blood, man's blood by man, his blood shall be shed. For in the image of God he made man. Genesis 9, 5 to 6. First institution of any human government is right there. Folks, this is the theological backdrop, can we say, of the sixth command that we have read. And I trust that it kind of adds depth and appreciation as we consider it this morning. So from it, just summing up that introduction, we have seen so far that the basis of this commandment is twofold, okay? Firstly, we see each individual human being is created in the image of God and is therefore naturally and immeasurably invaluable. Invaluable. And secondly, all humanity is joined by our mutual parentage and those into whom God himself has breathed the breath of life. Those are the, those are the two kind of uh, uh, summary statements that we can gain from our text this morning. You see, when one man murders another, he is doing exactly what Cain did, slaying the image of God and one who was his brother. He steals life from him and from one whom to God breathed that very life. So those succinct, we need to understand his command and apply it appropriately. And in order to do that, what we're going to first look at is what this command prohibits. And you might say, well, that's a bit of a no-brainer. Thou shalt not murder, or you shall not murder. In some older translations... Good translations, mind you, but probably not the right choosing of words here. It's got, thou shalt not kill. Nothing wrong with that translation, but the trouble is we put different spins on words and kill has a very, very broad meaning. A more accurate translation, therefore, here in this text is you shall not murder. Because as we take the, the, this broad meaning of the word kill and apply it uh, to taking life of any kind or in any, any circumstances, that's how it can be applied. And on the basis of that translation, uh, some would say, well, we're in opposition to any forms of taking life in war. They would say the capital punishment is completely out because thou shalt not kill and even the taking of a life in self-defense is out because the Bible says thou shalt not kill. Some even take it to read the killing of animals as they equate the life of animals on the same level as human beings. But we do not do that, do we? You know, I saw in a bumper sticker only yesterday and I pointed it out to my wife. Well, actually, it wasn't a bumper sticker. It was actually right around the number plate. We exist to save animals from extinction. I thought, really? Is that our 
Purpose statement for life? No, not. So oh, I'll pick it that this animal person was a real animal over and, and equated them on the same level as us. And um, anyway, so what does this command include and how comprehensive is it? Well, to understand that, we must compare Scripture with Scripture uh, to get a true interpretation. Because we have recorded in Scripture cases where, where God commands in the Old Testament, and you will know this, God commands the killing of others in war and also to kill animals to sacrifice them for food. And so from this we learn that definitely is the case that all killing is not murder. There is a difference. For example, in 1 Samuel 5.18, the old prophet reminded Saul um, of the command that God had given him. And, um, and he said, and he sent you on a mission saying, go and completely destroy those wicked people, the Amalekites, make war on them until you have wiped them out. So that's a command of God. Also, God himself killed innocent Animals in the Garden of Eden, he must have. Because remember, he clothed Adam and Eve with coats of skin. So there, an animal was killed to provide that covering. And so, also God commanded the offering of an animal. A sacrifice. It was a part of worship during the Old Testament era. Always thinking about too. Remember David, he was commended for his bravery. What did he do? He killed the lion and a bear, right? Jesus himself, remember, he ate the Passover lamb. He ate the Passover. So an animal had to be killed following his resurrection. And just to take this a little bit further to understand that all killing is not murder, during Esther's time, you might not know too much about this lady, Esther, but in that story of Esther, there was a justified killing in self-defense. Oops. There was this evil day in Esther's time. And the enemies of the Jews were about to murder them by thousands on this one special day. But what happened in a massive turnaround and through God's enabling and and his providence, what the Jews did on that special day was they defended themselves. Esther 9.5 records this. Thus the Jews smote all their enemies with the stroke of the sword and slaughter and destruction and did what they would unto those that hated them. In other words, to those who tried to murder them. There was really a case of self-defense going home uh, on here. In other words, what happened is the invaders came to the very place where the Jews were gathering, just like an enemy coming into your house to invade your space and to take your life. And in this case, the Jews took their swords and, and dealt with them. Nor does this command prohibit capital punishment, as horrible as this may seem to some. The Lord instituted this in Genesis 9-6 when he said to Noah, as we've already read, whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed, for in the image of God he made man. But it doesn't just stop there. Paul constitutes this further and extrapolates this further, this, this principle here in Romans 13 and verse 4, where he, he instructs believers that capital punishment is to be carried out by duly constituted government authority. You might say he does. How does it say that? Let me read it to you in this text, 13 and 4 of Romans. For he is God's servant, that is, the government, the authority that God has placed you under, whether it be, by the way, a good government or a bad government. Whether it be a dictator or a good guy, that's where God has placed you at the moment. This is what it says, for he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Now, understanding the imagery here, the sword in Paul's day was in the time of the Romans, was a symbol of... An instrument of death, which included a penalty for crimes that deserved it. So this sixth command, as we're thinking about it, does not prohibit killing an enemy in a military combat. It doesn't prohibit killing of, of animals, nor does it prohibit the taking of life in, a self, in self-defense, nor does it prohibit the state from executing murderers. 
So what does it prohibit? What does this command prohibit? The Webster Dictionary describes murder accurately in this way. The unlawful and malicious or premeditated killing of one human being by another. This kind of killing has been around as long as the world itself, as you know, and as we've looked at this morning. We've seen this from Genesis 4.8, where the first murder was committed. Where Cain deliberately, with hateful, premeditated intent, physically ended Abel's life. So it was not an accident on that case, nor was it self-defense. It was pure, intentional murder. It wasn't accidental. We have words for that even in our economy, right? We call it manslaughter or things like that. But folks, today we are living in a violent society And might I say, our culture with its video imaging, and dare I say, from what I can gather, our video games, drugs, alcohol, pathetic and light court sentencing, none of those things help curb but merely incite this violent plague. There are, of course, many other factors that contribute toward intentional murderous actions, and we can't kind of blame those things. We're not blame shifting in here. But what I'm highlighting is that there are many things that incite rather than curb. But the main reason so many folks neglect this command is that they neglect God, His Word, and His church. You know that? People who ignore God of whose image they bear are are more vulnerable to sin of every kind, including murder. Just trace through Romans chapter 1 and see what happens. There we see mankind neglecting God. And it doesn't just stop there. There's a progress, right? There's a history of progress. And you can take that personally. You can take it nationally or whatever. There's progress when a person neglects God, his word, and the church. And it's a massive warning there, even for believers. As soon as we neglect God or don't prioritize him as he should, there will be a story to tell of the consequences that are very negative in that person's life. Romans 1 tells us, and it ends up where God gives them over to a depraved mind. What they give themselves to, God gives them to, and it eats them up, and it ends in absolute disaster, and murder is one of them. One reason that murder is such a horrendous crime is simply this, you can't undo it. You can steal from a person. You have that commandment, and then a couple later on, thou shalt not steal. You can steal from a person, but you know what? You can make restitution. You can give it back, plus more. You can make restitution. But not only, but what with murder, you can't. You cannot give a person's life back. But not only is murder a crime against the victim, it's a crime against the family, it's a crime against society, and it's a crime against God, who is the giver of life. You shall not murder. This command also prohibits personal murder or suicide. Australian Bureau of Statistics Statistics record in 2015 that there were 3,027 suicides, which means over eight people every day commit personal murder. That's pretty horrendous, isn't it? Now, I know this is very sensitive, and it is, and I want to be, uh, and it impacts lives deeply. Because any suicide leaves emotional scars that I don't believe would ever go away. 
And for that, I want to be careful. I want to be tender on this subject. I don't want to be offensive or, or hurt anyone. But the truth of the matter is, folks, just as we have no right to murder another person, neither do we have the right to murder ourselves. And yet suicides have occurred throughout history and in this country every single day. For example, we go back to scriptures we see in 2 Samuel 17.23, just to show you that this is just not a, 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 a 21st century thing or a 20th century thing. 2 Samuel 17.23, there we read of a man you probably not even know of or can't remember. His name is Othiphiel, I can't even say it, Othiphiel, okay, a real hard one. And so he, he, he was a, kind of a counsellor to Absalom, Remember? When Absalom overtook the throne of David. And so Ahithophel thought, oh wow, I'm going to give this guy advice. And Absalom came along and asked him for advice. And Absalom rejected his advice in favor of other advice from someone else. And the Bible tells us that Ahithophel came so depressed at being rejected that he went home, set his house in order and then hanged himself. What a sad, foolish thing for him to do. Someone says, but what I do with my life, surely that's my business. It's all mine. No, sorry, it's not your business. Your life is God's business. Whether a person or not is a Christian or not, the life he has or she has, it's given by him, by God, given to him by God, and only only God himself has the right to take it or end it. Psalm 100 verse 3 says, Know that the Lord, He is God. It is He who made us, and we are His. We are His people, the sheep of His pasture. Christian or not Christian, you have no right to take your life because you do not belong to yourself, even though you think you might. You see, when a person is driven to suicide, it is often the result of circumstances going from bad to worse. In other words, they get to a situation where they cannot see any light at the end of the tunnel, so to speak. So they feel so overwhelmed with all that's going on in life or, what, or with what not, what's not going on, and so they decide to end it, to end it all. But all they do is leave a woeful wake of other destroyed lives. It is a selfish and sinful way to leave the world. And just as no man has the right to murder another, no man has the right to murder self. The number of our days on this earth are the sole right of God himself. You shall not murder. And thirdly, this command also prohibits prenatal murder. What I'm referring to here is abortion. I've never had the opportunity to speak specifically like I'm about to now. And I'm fully aware of the liable repercussions, even in our country, for me saying what I'm going to say. Folks, if there was ever an area in which our nation is guilty and is in controversy with God, it is in the murder of its unborn children. According to Pregnancy Outcome Unit, South Australian Health, there were over, there were 4,650 abortions in South Australia in 2014. You get that? 4,650 abortions in 2014. And in the whole country, over 30,000. And just to add and highlight the moral compass of our nation a little further, The Australian Institute of Health and Welfare record that only 196 Aussie-born children were adopted in 2015 and 2016. So rather than adopt them and give birth to them and acknowledge that these are made in the image of God, we will kill them, murder them, rather than even adopt them. What a tragedy. A wicked, evil, self-inflicted tragedy to say the least. Our society, like much of the Western world, seems to view the unborn human being as a mass, simply a mass of 
unidentified waste and to be thrown away at the mother's convenience. Folks, let me say this. The unborn child, no matter what stage of fetal growth, is not the business of the mother to do with as she chooses. You get that? It's not the business of the mother to do with as she chooses. It is God's business. Scripture tells us that life begins at the moment of conception. This is just not my opinion or this church's opinion. This is, the Bible is the authority on this. Psalm 139, and you'll know these verses well, but they are so applicable for what this topic is. Verses 13 and 16, let me read that to you and listen carefully. And the psalmist says, For you formed my inward parts, you knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, my soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me when as yet there was not none of them. Pretty clear. God values human life. From the day of conception. As believers, especially young people here this morning, never allow the cultural drift to soften and dumb down the truth that the unborn child indelibly bears the, living of the, the image of the living God. Never dumb that down because the unborn child does, bears the image of the, God, of the living God. You shall not murder. This command also prohibits in inward murder. You might say, what on earth are you thinking about inward murder? What is that? What I mean by this is, just as the outward act of physical murder is condemned, so is the, the inner hostility and hatred that we can have that leads to the physical act. You know, one of the most sobering verses and hard-hitting texts in the Bible is 1 John 3.15. Some of our, one of our home groups would have been looking at this some time back and that verse says this everyone who hates his brother is a murderer and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him that's pretty heavy isn't it now please understand this is not saying that the inward action of hate brings about the same damage as outward murder no it doesn't bring about the same damage but what this does say is that habitual, ongoing hatred toward another is a form of murder in God's eyes. And if not curbed and repented of, it can and will lead to physical murder. And I might say eternal hell. Why is that? Because this proves that this person is not a genuine believer because no genuine believer will have habitual, ongoing hatred toward their brother, whether that person be a Christian or whether that person not be a Christian. If you have ongoing, habitual hate in your heart towards someone for whatever they have done to you, you better check out to see whether they're really saved or not, folks, because this verse tells us that no genuine believer will have that. Only the unbeliever will have that unbridled hatred. They're in danger of eternal hell. So you need to repent. Because I must say, all of us have, as Christians, we can have the, um, the odd spout of distaste and even anger and may even be hatred towards someone but you know what if that person is a genuine Christian they will repent they will ask forgiveness they'll get themselves right with the Lord Matthew 15 and verse 19 reminds us for out of the heart what proceeds out of the heart proceeds evil thoughts murders adulteries and it's got a whole list of other sins inward murder I trust that there's no one here harboring hatred toward one another you shall not murder so far we have seen what this command negatively prohibits now I want to briefly sum up what this command positively implies positively implies very simply this command 
strongly implies that we're to recognize and value the sanctity of human life, right? Years ago, when we were kids, and some of you will remember this little chorus that we used to sing, and, and you might have sung in your Sunday school, and it goes like this. Red and yellow, black and white, all are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. Good theological chorus, he does. But you see, folks, those little children grow to adults. From conception to children to adulthood, every single one of us are made in the image of God. We are like Jesus and are to be like Jesus and to value and to love them like he does. You see, at the foundation of all murder lurks hatred. It kind of sits at the door waiting to pounce. What is the opposite of that? It's love, right? It's got to be love. It is love. This means that the ultimate implied teaching of this command in um, in Exodus 20 verse 13 is that we are to love one another as I have loved you, John 15 and 12. Or as James says in verse chapter 2 verse 8 and 9, if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You do well, but if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as a transgressor. You shall not murder. Positively implies that we are to love. We cannot sit on the fence and say, okay, I'm not murdering anyone and be happy and pious about ourselves and be indifferent about everything else. No, no, no. As equally as a prohibition, this command implies that we are to be proactive in our love toward one another, and especially toward believers. This means active love rather than indifference. And we dare not incite any form of hatred, right? I know we may get upset about people and we see immigrants coming into the country by the thousands and they are Muslims, etc. But folks, every single one of them is made in the image of God and it's not our place and we better not incite any kind of hatred toward those people. So this has the implication of loving. And this, this, by the way, this implication will have many faces. Many faces. For example, if that you shall not murder means that we should be all about, as believers, curbing the video games where killing goes on and it's the ultimate prize. Unbelievable, the graphics you can get these days. And, and, and to see the games that the kids are play, playing. And even in church, they come along and they play video games where killing is involved. As parents, we'll certainly go all out to curb that, right? Because if we don't, what are we doing? We're encouraging and inciting hatred and violence. We'll certainly monitor the kind of movies we, they watch and we'll, and we'll be teaching and imaging the love of Christ for salvation for sinners. That's what you should be doing and we need to be doing. We'll be teaching them to be impartial toward others and not to incite just because others may be different or they might even be invading our space. Even if this country is invaded with a lot of people, is God sovereign or not? Of course he's sovereign. Bring it on, Lord. It's, it's opportunity for the gospel. We're not to take any stance of hatred. See, folks, the value of God of a human being is beyond anything this world has or ever will produce or manufacture. You know that? No monetary, moral, political, or personal value should ever reduce or denigrate our assessment of another human being. This is real heavy stuff. It's real important. And I think we as Christians have lost some of it, a lot of this, because we're carried away by the hype and the media and, and, and our political ideals. So we again ask, why? 
Why, why should, we, should we think like that? Why should we not denigrate other people? Simply this, the psalmist said of mankind, he said this in Psalm 8 verse 5, For thou hast made him, that's mankind, for thou hast made him a little lower than the angels and has crowned him with glory and honor. That's mankind, folks. That's mankind. That's your neighbor. That's a person that you don't probably think very highly of or, 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 or has, has done some terrible things. He's been made in the image of God and he's been crowned with the glory of honor. And God values them above the angels. And because of that, and especially we who are now God's redeemed people by his grace through faith, what we are to do, we're to love one another. We're to look out for one another. And we're to help one another. And the only way that any of us can do that as we are ought, as we ought, is by following the Savior trustfully and obediently. Because as we follow him trustfully and obediently, what are we doing? We are imaging him. Because as we're made in God's image before the fall, now that we're being born again, we are new creatures in Christ, the Apostle Paul tells the Corinthians. And so now, because we have the Spirit of God indwelling us, and now that we're a new people in Christ, we can image Jesus Christ. I trust this few words have been a help and a challenge to us this morning. And the Word of God will be powerful in our lives. Shall we give thanks to God and pray? And after I pray, uh, Bill Panaloon is going to come and just make a small announcement. Our Heavenly Father, we just bow before you. Well, Father, just a few words and a commandment, but Lord, how powerful it is. And so relevant, right from the day it was uttered, and written down on that table of stone to this very day. And how we as believers need to take heed that mankind is made in the, your image. And you are choosing and you are redeeming a people out of every tribe, every nation, every kind of background to be your people. And we are some of those, Father. Father. We cannot lift our heads up in pride and, and say we are better than anyone else because we were tarred with that same sinful nature. But Lord, you loved us. And because you loved us, help us to love others for the gospel's sake. Because there are thousands and millions needing the gospel. And so help us to be images of Christ. And help us to show others the love of God that has been shed abroad in our hearts. So, Father, take this word and apply it to our hearts today and lives, we pray. These things we would ask in the name of our Lord Jesus. Amen.